Hello friends, and welcome to yet another video for my series Quick Thoughts On, in which I always talk about different stories from the rich Star Trek universe. 50 years and a month ago, NBC aired the next episode of the classic Star Trek series called That Which Survives, and these are my honest opinions about it. The Enterprise stumbles upon uh, something what Spock calls a ghost planet, and Kirk, McCoy, Sulu and uh, geologist Diamato decide to beam down to explode it. As soon as the transport starts, a strange but good-looking woman, who for some reason looks like Catwoman, appears in the transporter room, touches the transporter chief and he collapses. When the landing party materializes on the planet, and they are confused what just happened, but before they have the chance to think about it, a huge earthquake happens. And I must say you one thing, I am seriously impressed by the fact that this is not achieved uh, as usually by shaking the camera, but they actually shook different parts of the set. Great work. When it stops, our heroes find out that the Enterprise is no longer on orbit and assume it was destroyed. And that was the reason for the shake. And as I said a few weeks ago, I would prefer if we didn't see the Enterprise in this episode, but unfortunately we cut between the landing party and the Enterprise during the majority of this story, completely ruining the flow and the mystery. So while the landing party thinks that the Enterprise has been destroyed, the Enterprise crew has been thrown away by an unknown force and now has to find a way how to get back to the planet. The landing party splits, trying to find some water and food, and the Amato meets the same woman which we have seen on the Enterprise. Well, he's fat, we have never seen him before, and he looks like... He has just a few weeks until retirement. I'm pretty sure he will be fine, right? Couldn't they make it more obvious by hiring a black actor or at least putting him into a red shirt? She of course touches him and the rest of the party finds a nasty surprise. Meanwhile on the Enterprise we again after a long time see Dr. Mbenga. The last time we have seen him was in A Private Little War. He and a doctor we won't see, called Sanchez, are doing the autopsy of the transporter chief, and it looks like every cell in his body has been blasted from inside. Let's pretend that's not stupid. The Enterprise has been thrown away 990.7 light years, and Spock orders the ship to be flown back using warp 8. And I'm pretty sure there is somebody in the audience who will say, how long should it last? Scotty meanwhile feels the ship feels wrong and sends crewman Watkins to check the bypass valve on the matter and antimatter reaction chamber. Okay, we haven't seen this guy before, he's black and he's in red, plus he will be alone in a dark room. If you guessed he will live a long and happy life, you should watch more Star Trek. Of course, he meets Catwoman, who first gathers some information and then touches him. Scotty hears him yell, but when he runs there, Watkins is already dead and Catwoman disappears. Meanwhile, back on the planet, they try to bury the Amato, but the floor is made of some strange material which cannot be penetrated by the phasers which suggests to them that the planet is artificial. But there is no time for exploration, these gentlemen are getting gold, it's time for a nap. Sulu, as the youngest one, uh, stays on guard, and very soon he is visited by the mysterious alien woman. They start to chat, but when she starts to say creepy things like she wants to touch him, he starts panicking. And to be honest, George Takei is great in pretending that he doesn't want to be touched by a woman. He falls down, so she touches him only on a small part of his shoulder, before Kirk and McCoy arrive to save him. She tries to touch Kirk, but nothing happens to him, which seems to confuse her. 
funny, shouldn't she know how her powers work? She seems to know that she's there specifically for Sulu, so why does she seem surprised that her powers don't work on the captain? Confused, she disappears using an embarrassing 1960s video effect, and our heroes have time to think about their strategy. They will protect each other using their own bodies. Meanwhile, back on the ship, things are happening, but they're not interesting. The woman has done techno babble to the ship, which means uh, the Enterprise flies now using warp speeds like warp 14, and will explode in 15 minutes. Which means Spock and Scotty have to techno babble their way out of it. Scotty crawls into a Jeffrey's tube. And he puts a thing into a thing, but before he has uh, to do a thing with the thing, and only after that he can put the thing into a thing. And I am something what I haven't been for a long time watching TOS. Bored. This whole section feels like it's taken from a very bad episode of Star Trek Voyager. I hate repeating myself, but I would really prefer if we haven't seen the Enterprise at all. And, of course, Scotty saves the ship. Back on the planet, Catwoman appears to try uh, to kill Kirk this time, using the power of Belay, McCoy and Sulu save him. She tells them that she is Lucira, commander of this space station. Kirk confuses her with her, his questions so much that she rather disappears. Then a door opens and they are invited to a visit. They go down and appear in a computer room. At least, that's what we are told it is. All we see is a giant cube hanging from the ceiling. It looks like it produces the replicas of Lucira, the original station commander. So, now is a good time to ask what are these things? Are they some androids, some projections, or... We get many questions, but practically no answers. But now the computer suddenly does something what it should have done since the first moment. It sends three replicas of Losira, one for every one of them. Which means they can't no longer defend themselves against Losira. And which means that I have to ask, why didn't the computer do this immediately? Is there a limit of how many Losiras it can produce? If it can produce three at a time, this story could be over in five minutes. And again, what exactly are they? We know they are not androids, or we have been told it. So, what are they? Some holographic projections? Well, they can touch our heroes, and our heroes can touch them, which means they are physically there. So, what exactly are they? But never mind that. How will our heroes get out of uh, this serious problem? Well, Spock ex machina. Spock and another red shirt beam down, because they have now returned. Kirk orders them to destroy the computer and they shoot it. And now it blinks slightly slower, which apparently means that it was destroyed. Come on, are you so cheap you can't blow up a small cube? I mean, I know the third season has been made uh, for the price of a ham sandwich, but the effects in this episode are really embarrassing. But then we see a wall projection of Losira, and she kind of explains to us what this episode was about. Kind of, sort of, not really. Sorry, but if your explanation leaves more questions than answers, maybe your explanation needs a rewrite. This episode was written by DC Fontana, which is a good thing, I'm sort of a fanboy, I really love her work, so I should love this episode, right? Well, this episode is credited to Michael Richards for the story and John Meredith Lucas for the script, which is a bad thing. Michael Richards is of course DC Fontana, but she used the names of her two brothers, Michael and Richard, every time she hated what they have done to her original script. So yes, DC Fontana was personally embarrassed by the final script and requested her name to be taken off. And I absolutely see why. 
this episode has so many problems, but it also gets many things right. It just makes me wonder what the original story was like. On my standard scale from 0 to 10, where 0 is complete garbage, 10 is a masterpiece, and 5 is just average, I would give this episode 7 out of 10. It's clearly above average, especially for season 3 standard, and it's pretty enjoyable if you don't think about the story too much, but it could be so much better. And when you read interviews with DC Fontana about her unpleasant working experiences with the season 3 showrunner, it makes you question why didn't Roddenberry run season 3, but instead brought in Fred Freiberger. And makes you wonder how good the original story could be. But anyway, as always, these were just my opinions, so let me know what did you think about this episode. Did you love it, hate it, or did you think it was just okay? Let me know what did you think down in the comment section, and it's time for me to watch the next episode of Star Trek Discovery. Which means, see you very soon, hopefully tomorrow. Thanks a lot for watching, and bye.